As you're being seated, if you will, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12 as we dig into uh, God's Word together. And we're talking about specifically how to endure the race. How to endure the race. You know, I don't know about you, but I actually really enjoy uh, running. I enjoy uh, early morning jogs. I like listening to books, listening to worship music, or just simply unplugging completely and just listening to the crickets and the tree frogs going crazy uh, early in the morning. Uh, There's something just peaceful about that time because I have learned that if I want to do anything peaceful in my house, It has to be done before my family, kids, Katie, not you, but before our kids, whoopsie daisies, all right, before my kids wake up or after they go to bed, all right, and so that's just kind of a rule of thumb. If you want to have peace or tranquility, then it requires for all of the other little humans to be asleep, okay, just a rule in our house, but uh, now think about that run, though. I'm not running competitively. I'm not trying to beat any world records or anything like that. And if I'm just going to be completely honest, I am not even trying to beat my own records anymore, okay? Those days are behind me, unfortunately. Uh, And so I can have that peaceful run because it's just a jog. It's a light jog, right? Uh, But what is interesting That when we see this over and over through scripture, that we see that the Christian life or the life of a believer is much like a race. But here's what is true of my morning run. And I was thinking about that this morning as I was running and getting my mind prepared for today. That if I get too fast or if I begin to get winded in any way or if I get a cramp or anything like that, all I have to do is slow down a little bit. And to be honest, if it gets too bad, all I have to do is stop and begin to walk. Nothing is really making me or causing me to keep pushing myself in that way. But if you're running competitively or if you're running away from a bear or a snake or something. And can I just tell you, uh, every morning that I'm running, I'm always paranoid that a bear is going to pop out and we're in East Texas. All right, it's just a weird thing. All right, rabbit trail. But if you are running like that, then you don't have that option. It's like this requirement to continue to press on, to continue to press in. And it's the same thing in the Christian life, that there's this expectation that you cannot just give up or quit anytime you want. You don't have that option to just let off the gas. And I love what we see in Hebrews chapter 12. Because the author in Hebrews chapter 12 gives us this better understanding of what this race really is. What it's all about. And how we can stay motivated through the race. And so let's stand and let's read together. All right, if you're able to, if you have a copy of God's Word, it's in Hebrews chapter 12. For all of our new believer, uh, new kindergartners in the room, this is on page 1600 in your new Bible that you received this morning. But it says this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just ask you right now, very simply, God, would you take your word and would you apply it to every person that is here? Father, that we may know you for the first time, that you open our eyes to your truth maybe for the first time. Or maybe the believer that is in the room that just needs encouragement from you today. God, would you speak to them today in ways that only you can. 
And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, so you may be seated. And I hope you recognize this, that in the middle of this is really this pivotal phrase in verse 1. It's kind of the, the really the direction of, of this entire passage. This says in verse 1, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Look, if you were to look at the original Greek of this verse, it would say, let us run with the agona of this race. The agona, okay? Does that word sound familiar at all to you? This is where we get our English word agony. This is where we translate that word into what we all understand as something that is agonizing or brings agony upon us. And so what the writer is saying pretty much is let us run, give us the endurance so that we may run with this agony. Now that's a very uplifting and encouraging message for you this morning, right? That the Christian life, when you think about it, that it can be boiled down into something that is agonizing. That's really what the author is getting at. That there is agony in life that we must learn to endure for the benefit of the kingdom of God. Now, uh, there are moments that we are all taught at times that, that the Christian life, that everything will just get better if you give your life to Jesus. That everything in your life, uh, the debts that you owe financially, the job that you just can't seem to land, uh, the friends that you just need new ones, uh, maybe a relationship that just continues to fall apart. And if you give your life to Jesus, then all of these things will be turned upside down and everything look, it will just be daisies and rainbows. And guess what? There's no pain or suffering in your life. And guess what? That is a lie from the pit of hell. There's actually nothing further than the truth in the Christian life. And, and at times, it seems that after you give your life to Jesus, it, when pain and suffering really begins to arise in your life. I mean, we have moments in Scripture with Paul after he gave his life to Jesus that, that these were the moments that he was shipwrecked. These were the moments that Paul, one of the greatest apostles, that he was beaten, that he was just left for dead. He was stoned. He was bitten by a snake. All of these things was happening to him after the road to Damascus. After he surrendered to Jesus' salvation. After he gave his life to Jesus. And so it's not like that there's this magic pill that if I give my life to Jesus, now everything is going to get better. If so, we would not have to discuss how to endure the race together. The Christian life is something that you are called to endure, that it requires endurance. Even Jesus himself, when he was talking with his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 33, he gives this guarantee to his disciples. He says, you will, you will have suffering in this world. It's a guarantee. He doesn't say you may come across a time or a season in your life that things get difficult. Jesus doesn't say, hey, there might be a moment in your life when things get tough. He doesn't say that. He says you will endure suffering. You will have suffering in this life. And these are disciples who have given their life to Jesus. They surrendered their livelihood. They surrendered their jobs. They walked away from everything and said, Jesus, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. I'm going to follow you. And he says, listen, it's not what you think. Foxes have holes. Birds of the air, they have nests. But the Son of Man, I, myself, don't even have anywhere to lay my head. It's almost like he's pushing away the disciples from following him. But they say, no, 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 Jesus, we're with you all the way. And he says, you will endure suffering. Paul, even at the end of his life, 
We, we see this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. He says this about his life. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. You see, these statements are not from these guys who just have taken it easy in life. These are battle-hardened men who have said, this has been a struggle. These are warriors talking here. And they're saying, this is what it takes. But do you see what Paul said, though, in John chapter 16? Oh, excuse me, in 2 Timothy 4. He says, I have fought the good fight. Now, we may, as we are talking through this, and, and what does it mean to endure the race? What does it mean, this Christian life? Why does it seem so gloomy today? I thought I was supposed to come to church and feel better about myself. I want to remind you what Paul says about this fight, what he says about this race. He says, yes, it is difficult. It is, it is hard, but it is good. And Paul comes to the end of his life and says, everything I have laid out for Jesus, everything I have surrendered to him, the shipwreck, the stoning, the beating, all of these things is worth it because of Jesus. And so how do we stay motivated in this race? I want you to see what the author gives us in Hebrews chapter 12. First, we need to learn that we need to look to the saints of the past. I don't know if you know this or not, but in Hebrews chapter 11, the author gives us like this, this hall of fame role uh, of the saints. All right, so don't, don't go back and look for Drew Brees. Okay, I've already looked. He's not there, all right? It's not that kind of saint. You know what? That should have landed very well. Y'all should have giggled a lot harder than that. <laughs> but whatever, we'll move on. All right, but look to the saints of the past. In Hebrews chapter 11, he gives this role of these hall of famers. Of these guys who have gone before us and he's given us a reminder that, hey, you have guys who have gone before you, who have ran the same race, they've had the same struggles, they've gone through all of these things. And I just want to remind you that you can make it. That's what it's about. Uh, just the other day, we were, uh, our family was at a pool and there's this enclosed uh, slide. Okay, a water slide is enclosed and so you can't see to the bottom. And so Lincoln, our three-year-old, is up top, and he will not go down the slide. He just won't do it. And we're trying to get him, hey, Lincoln, it's all right. I mean, um, you can make it. You're not going to die or whatever he's thinking. I don't know what's going through his head. But we're, we're saying, you can make it. Just go down the slide. Just do it. And so we're cheering him on, okay? Well, he still wouldn't do it. And so what do we do? Well, we send our oldest down, Riley. She goes down the slide. Then we send the next one, Reagan. She goes down the slide. Then we send Rowan. She goes down the slide. And they're at the bottom. And they're saying, Lincoln, look, I, I told you it was fun. You can make it. See, it's the same thing in the Christian life. That, that when you can see that people have gone before you, that when you can understand that people have labored in the same way, that you can make it. You can do it. And the description that we see here is an entire stadium full of people cheering on the believers who are enduring the race currently. And just get this picture that it's not like the Tokyo Olympics with, with no spectators. The stadiums are full of saints who have gone before us and they're seeing us in this race and they're cheering us on they're saying keep going keep going keep running keep running because it is worth it you can make it you can do it this is why the author starts here he says listen you are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses who have gone before you and they're cheering you on and they're telling you, you can make it. You see, the second thing is that you look to the Savior of the promise. Look to the Savior of the promise. So we have the saints who have gone before us, and we have the Savior who is with us. And he gives us incredible promise. Listen to what they say 
in verse 2, it says, Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Some of your translation says the author and perfecter of our faith. What that means is that the one who created all things, the one who gave you the faith in the first place, is the one who is going to see you through to the end of the race. That as we are enduring this race together, that Jesus himself is with us. And see, the thing about Jesus is Jesus is not just some character off in the distance. He's not just at the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. You see, the Jesus, the Emmanuel, means that God is with us and he wasn't with us. He is with us. You see, Jesus makes this claim right before his ascension. He tells all of his disciples at the end of Matthew, he says, listen, I am going to give you an impossible task. I am telling you to go and make disciples, but I want to remind you of one thing about this mission, this one thing about the race that I am setting you on. Not one time will I ever leave you. Not one time will I ever forsake you. That even in your darkest moments of your life where you think that the weight of the world is on top of you, weighing you down, bearing on top of you, Jesus is saying, I am with you. And you may not recognize what I'm doing or how I am working this out, but it is for your good because I am going to not just run alongside you, I will carry you when I need to. It is Jesus who is with us for those who have Put their faith in him. Now, I, I want to help us with this picture, though. Um, at the end of verse 1, right before you get to verse 2, when it says, keep your eyes, keeping your eyes, means that there is something important that we should recognize before getting to that, keeping your eyes. So as you are doing something, you should be keeping your eyes. What is it that we should be doing? It's the end of verse 1. It says, therefore, since we also have this cloud of witnesses surround us, it says, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. All right, so I'm going to get my buddy Tate. Hey, Tate, come up here real quick. Yeah, give them up. Yeah, Tate. Just to be honest, is that the biggest cheer you've ever had? Because they, they never cheer for me like that. All right, it hurts. All right. Hey, can you squat down a little bit? You're making me feel small. All right, I'm kidding. All right, so look, this is what I'm going to ask Tate. All right, Tate, right there is a weight vest. All right, I just want you to put that on, okay, if you can. All right, so just imagine, I don't know how it works, okay. So yeah, there we go. Yeah, just throw it on there. All right, so come over here, Tate. All right, so just imagine, Tate, you're a football player, right? Yes. You're here with your boys. All right, All right. so what position do you play? Offensive lineman. I would have never guessed that. Am I right, guys? All right. Uh, I would trust you to block for me. All right, so imagine, though, Tate shows up all right, to one of the games, which y'all's season opener against Kilgore is on September 4th. Yeah, how did I know that? Amazing. All right, so just imagine if Tate shows up and underneath his pads, underneath his jersey, underneath everything that he has, he's just carrying this weight vest. Because here's a good thing. I mean, I used to train with this for the fire department to get used to weight and things like this. And, and just imagine, because he's been training with this, he's been running with this weight, uh, that he decides, man, I've kind of gotten used to this. It feels pretty good. I'm just going to wear it to a game. Or imagine if you showed up to a race when you've been training with this weight vest and, and you show up to the race with this weight vest on and just say, you know, what, I'm just going to run like this. I mean, everybody would be looking at you like you're crazy. Everybody would say, there, why would you ever do that? And so this is what is incredible about this moment in Scripture. All right, and you're going to have to help me here in a second. But this is what is incredible. As we are keeping our eyes on Jesus, we are laying aside every hindrance and every weight of sin that could ever entangle us or ensnare us. And so it's this picture of him training or whatever, but then all of a sudden, just imagine you're running with this, you're trying to labor, you're in the game with this, and just imagine at halftime, if you take your pads off and you... Take this off. Go ahead and take it off. 
I mean, it's now at this moment that Jesus, this is what Jesus does with our sin. He takes off all of the weight of our sin. And he, that's very heavy, by the way. And he takes it down. He throws it aside. And then he gives his own coat of righteousness. He exchanges that. He says, lay aside all of these hindrances. Lay aside those things that are weighing you down so that you can run. All right, give it up for Tate, everybody. Tell him thank you. You see, what Jesus does is he says, no, 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 you, you cannot run that way. You, you, can't, you can't run with all of this way. You can't run with this sin. And so this is the invitation from Jesus here is that he says, listen, if you come to me and you just think about your own walk with Jesus, your own pace, your own race with this life. And some of you in this room, you just feel completely weighed down. You feel like you have all of the weight of the world on top of you, and there's nothing you can do to get rid of it. No matter how hard you try to dig out of this hole that you're in, in this trench that you're in, there's just something that is weighing you down week after week after week. And I'm telling you right now, this is the greatest invitation from Jesus because Jesus says this. He says, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, all of you who are held down by your sin. He says, come to me. Come to me. You know what he says? He says, you have the yoke of the world on you. But I will give you my yoke. It is easy. It is light. It gives you the freedom to run effectively. But see, this is what we do over and over again, even as we are believers in Jesus, that we start to really guess this process and, and we start to think to ourselves, I don't, I don't really know about this. I, th I think I should be doing something different. And so we begin to take the weights of the world back and we start stuffing them in our pockets and we're trying to run this race with extra weights. And, and maybe Jesus has taken care of the bulk of this vest, but we keep hanging on to these little weights and we're just stuffing them everywhere we can because I don't really trust what's happening right now. I'm going against this financial crisis. I'm going against this relational crisis and so over and over again we just stuff weights in our pocket and what the call here is he's saying stop holding on to the weight of the world he's saying if you want to run if you want to run if you want to endure this Christian life he's saying listen you have got to lay aside all of these weights you have got to lay aside all of these hindrances because here's what happens when we take our focus off of Jesus. Then we begin to trust in anything else. We begin to pack on these weights over and over again. And Jesus is saying, listen, if you want to run, if you want to endure, then get rid of those things. The things that are taking your eyes off of me, get rid of those things. The things that are, are, are a hindrance to your walk with me. He's saying, get rid of those things so that you can run with complete freedom. And I know that in this room right now, there are so many of us who are carrying weights that we shouldn't be carrying. Maybe you in your walk, you are recognizing for the first time that you have never given your life to Jesus. You have never surrendered your life to Jesus. You still have on this entire weighted vest. You're trying to walk through life. And Jesus is saying, you got to come to me because here's the third and final thing. That we need to look to the satisfaction of the prize. The satisfaction of the prize that every time we try to pack on the weight of the world, it's an attempt to be satisfied. It's an attempt to find joy. It's an attempt to find meaning. And what we see here is that Jesus is the only prize that's worth it. Listen, if you are running the race of life for anything that can be found here on earth, let me just tell you, it is not worth it. 
the only thing that is worth it is the person who is standing there waiting for your homecoming. And if you give your life to Jesus, you will come face to face with him. And you will hear two things. All right, every single one of us, whether you give your life to Jesus or not, we will hear one of two things. You will either hear, away from me, I never knew you. When you come face to face with Jesus, he may say, away from me, I never knew you. Or he can look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome home. And the only question that you need to answer for that is, have you ever given your life to Jesus? Have you ever fully surrendered to him? The Bible says that if we confess our sins to the Lord and say, Jesus, I know I am a sinner and I know that I need you, the Bible says that he will be faithful and just and he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He will take all of the weight of your sin and throw it to the side. He took care of that with his blood on the cross. And he will cleanse you if you trust in him today. Psalm chapter 16 verse 11 says, In your presence, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do you have that relationship with Jesus? Can I just say that I know that you and I, we are enduring a race together. That's what it means to be a body of believers. That's what it means to be a church, that we recognize that we are all in this race together. Even in the midst of transition, in the midst of change, in the middle of things that maybe we don't necessarily want to do, maybe because we are confused about why do we have to make these changes, why do we have to do these things, why can't we just continue down this path, why can't we just do this? And it's difficult, and it's hard. But I just want to remind you that we know for a fact that we are better together. We can endure the race better when we are together. That we can hold each other up better when we are together. And this takes all people of the church, of every generation of the church, for you and I to endure the race together. And so this is not the end of the race for us. This last resonate is not the end of the race for us. This is a turn in the journey so that we can continue pressing forward into the mission that God himself has called us to do because it is not just what we have going on right here. We have people around the city of Tyler who have no relationship with Jesus and they are desperate for the gospel. They are desperate to hear that they don't have to race with all of this weight, that they don't have to spend an eternity in hell, but there is a good news and there is a person named Jesus who wants to enter into their life who wants to save them from their sin and put them on this race so that we may all endure together and that is what God is calling us to do and I'm just going to ask you to stay engaged endure the race with us Give us time. Let's be patient together as we transition into the next season of what God has called us to do. And I'm telling you that I believe this with all my heart, that we will experience what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no heart has ever understood, because God has an incredible plan moving forward for Green Acres Baptist Church, and the best is yet to come for us as a church family. When there are people who need Jesus, there's more work to be done, and you and I are in the race together. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you would, right now, Father, that you would continue, God, to work in our lives. God, I ask you, Jesus, that, that you would remind us of 
why we gather together. And God, we just want to thank you for what you have done, Father, in these past 11 years of what foundation you have given Green Acres Baptist Church right here in this room. So that we may take this foundation and continue to move forward, reaching people with your truth. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, for the person who doesn't know you. God, I ask right now, Lord, that you would speak to them and that you would give them the courage to respond. And God, as we continue in our time of worship, God, would you continue to work on our heart? And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.